Hello everybody, and welcome to Gaming in the Wild, a video games podcast about games from the artistic, creative side of the tracks, from indie to AAA. My name's John, I'm your host, I'm a journalist based out in Reykjavik, Iceland, where tonight I'm recording pretty late, it's 2am. I wasn't planning to record this late, but the game that I'm going to talk about today is one of the more complicated games that I have tackled. It's a 2019 release by Zawam Studios that's due for a console release this year. It won a lot of awards, but so far has only been played by Steam players on PC and Mac. It's a kind of a a fear and loathing style deep dive into the mind of a, a crazy protagonist and a murder mystery called Disco Elysium. And I wasn't sure what game I was going to talk about today because usually I play a game across the course of the week and I gather my thoughts about it and then talk about it at the end of the week. And this week I was still mostly engaged by Fallout 4. And as I joked on Twitter, it's going to have to be renamed the, the Fallout 4 Weekly if I keep being that absorbed by one game to the exclusion of all of this. So I went through my my, um, my list of games that I've played um, and looked for prominent games, brilliant games that I hadn't talked about yet and did a little poll on Twitter. And the game that won out was Disco Elysium. So I played this one last December, just before Christmas. It was the last game that I played, the last game that I finished in 2020. And I had planned to talk about it for quite a while, but it's, it's a challenging game to comprehend fully, to talk about. Um, there's a lot going on in this game. So it took me a couple of hours to write my notes for the game and do my research because it's been a few months since I played it. So I'm going to try and do justice to that game today. I did play a couple of other games. Um, I got a review code for Sea of Solitude, which just came out on Switch. And I, I played um, an hour or two of that game. It's a game that I've had my eye on for a while, actually. It's very pretty. It has a great art style where you are sailing across uh, a sea with submerged towns beneath you, chased by huge black shapes and demons that swim under the water. And you play as Kay, a kind of a black furry female protagonist with red eyes. It looks like a shadow. And the game is kind of split between boating and a little uh, motorboat and exploring the rooftops and streets later on of this submerged world. It's themed on uh, depression and difficulty, psychological difficulty of all different kinds. And so it's a little bit of a heavy game. Um, And I played a couple of hours of it and I felt it getting under my skin a little bit. Um, I got to a part where you come into a school and there are these kind of black shadows that haunt you and tease you and taunt you. And I realised that I was starting to feel a bit anxious about playing the game. I can imagine that for a lot of people, this could be quite a triggering game. Um, But it is intriguing, to say the least. It's just dark and heavy, so I decided to take a break. I'm going to come back to Sea of Solitude and tackle it a bit later, a bit further down the road. I know a lot of people are playing it right now because of the Switch release um, and the kind of the remastered edition that just came out. I've had a a conversation with a few people that are playing it who have come to the same conclusions as me, actually, that it's it's just a challenging game to play. So I'm going to come back to that one. But I have also been continuing through Fallout 4. I've done a few quite monstrous long game sessions on that one. And I'm making some really solid progress through that game, and I'm still very engaged and addicted to it. Um, I managed to reach the central hub of the game, which is called Diamond City. It's a, a civilized town in an uncivilized world. Um, It's a town in a baseball stadium lit by the huge field lights, half of the bulbs of which have gone out. And it has a really cool kind of film noir atmosphere to it. There is a a local newspaper that tackles stories of political corruption and injustice and the ever-present threat of synths, which are kind of uh, robotic humans that are like a little bit like the the Cylons from Battlestar Galactica, so this is kind of digital paranoia going around. Um, and there's like a baseball enthusiast that you meet who's kind of got a little baseball bric-a-brac shop and he espouses the, the virtues of this forgotten game. He has all of the rules wrong in his mind because it's 200 years after the collapse of civilization. 
And so he thinks that the bats were, it was a combat sport and that the bats were like clubs. And as a vault dweller who actually remembers baseball, you kind of gently try to set him right. It's a really funny kind of Back to the Future 2 kind of take on a dystopian look at the present from the future. Um, I also came across one example of why I like this game so much. I came to a base that was set up in a kind of a ruined housing estate and it, it told three stories from three different eras simultaneously. And I was very impressed by the writing here. So as you come through the base, you quickly realize that it's been overtaken by these kind of mutants, these powerful mutants that just sort of destroy all that's in their path. They're kind of like orcs. And they've kind of festooned the base with all of their their gruesome stuff, like uh, lots of kind of meat and lots of heavy weapons, and they've trashed the place. But as you're advancing through the base, kind of taking care of these mutants and sniping them off, you unlock terminals, and the terminals tell you... They contain the diaries of the people that founded the town at the time of the war that, that led to this fallout civilization or, the, or lack of the wasteland. And so the people that set up the base describe founding it, building it, the events of the war, hiding underground, and then coming back out to try and find essential supplies, coming into contact with raiders... The kind of the bandits who who kind of take uh, uh, power in the overworld, and then the raiders came in and wiped out the original settlers, and you find bits and pieces of the raiders' stuff too. You'll find like cases containing raider armor, and you'll find their provisions and weapons and bodies around too. So as you're coming through this base, you're being told original story from the time of the war. You're being shown through objects. The, the raiders that came later and took over. And then finally, you're actually in combat with the, the mutants who even took out the raiders. And I was thinking that that's such a detailed and clever way to tell a story. Three stories, three timelines in one small encounter and one small area of the game. And that's the kind of the detailed writing that has, that has really taken me with Fallout 4. I think now I've explored about half of the map um, and I understand that this is quite an epic game to finish. I've got about 30 hours in it now and so I'm still really enjoying that game. But I know that I've talked about it a lot in the last couple of episodes so I'm not going to labour the point too much. I just thought I'd fill you guys in on how far I've gotten in that game. But before I talk about Disco Elysium, I will mention that this show has a Patreon. It's patron-supported. Um, if you would like to express your support for the show, whether you're a first-time listener or a long-term listener, um, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash gaminginthewild from as little as $1, euro, or pound a month. And for that, you'll get weekly sale recommendations, bonus episodes, and an invite to our Discord community, where myself and other listeners and friends talk about the games we're playing. It's a really fun little corner of the internet, a quiet little corner of the internet, where a bunch of nice people talk about games. So I really appreciate every patron who has signed up so far, and every patron that chooses to do so now. And if you're one of them, you'll have my thanks, and you can find that at patreon.com slash gaminginthewilds. And before I start talking about Disco Elysium, I thought I should also fill you guys in on the kind of the situation here in Iceland. We're still getting earthquakes. We had a big five on the Richter scale earthquake today. There is daily news about magma rising to the surface 20 kilometers from the city limits. And so we still got the earthquakes. We still got the, the threat of a volcanic eruption in the, the capital area. Um, and I don't know, I'll, I'll keep you apprised of uh, what's going on in the next episode. The geologists are telling us that we might have an eruption any time now, but that in geological terms that could be anything from tonight to, you know, 50 years from now. So I'm still living in a kind of an earthquake-ridden city for now. <laughs> but yeah, it's, the saga continues, and I will keep filling you in on whether or not we're... Um, under threat from volcanic gas and lava in the near future. And that's the weather and geology report. So let's move on to talking about Disco Elysium. (laughs) 
So Disco Elysium is a game that I had had my eye on for quite a while. I was kind of waiting for the console ports before I would play it, but in the end I saw it on uh, on sale in Steam for I think £18 or something, and I thought, yeah, the time has come. It's time to give this game a try. So I bought it on Steam for my MacBook. I played it on keys and the touchpad as a point and click game. It kind of worked out all right. But there is a definitive edition, or rather, they're calling it the final cut, like Blade Runner, I guess. Um, and that's going to come out later this year. It's coming out on PlayStation in March, and on PC and Mac. They'll get a free update for that, so I will too. And it's coming out on Xbox, Switch, and Stadia this summer. So it's going to be available for everyone this year. It's nice to talk about it now, and to flag it up to any console gamers who haven't played it yet. Um, there are going to be new missions in the final cut, 150,000 words of new dialogue, and it's going to be fully voice acted, which is quite exciting because um, it's a very text heavy game and only the first couple lines of dialogue are voiced, the rest is just written. And some of the text isn't voiced, for example, the various instincts that you'll hear speaking in the protagonist's head. So it's going to be very interesting to see what they do with that and I'm excited to see what they do with it. I'm also excited to see how they managed to rework the movement for direct control rather than point and click. And how, for example, like you can highlight objects in your area that are manipulable. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see what they do. And I think this could very well turn out to be, the console versions could turn out to be by far the best version of the game. The game was made by Zawam, an Estonian first time developer, and it was designed and written by Robert Kurvitz who had previously written sci-fi set in this universe, this game universe, and has worked for a long time in tabletop games. Um, he's been building up the fiction of this universe for a long time, and you can really feel that in the, the density and depth of the game world. And he has said that the game's influences vary from everything, everything from Planetscape Torment, a 1999 game that has some similar elements. He also gave shout-outs to Kentucky Route Zero, to TV shows like The Wire and True Detective and The Shield, to the writing of Emil Zola, and to the paintings of Rembrandt and Kandinsky. So I mean, you can probably tell from his reference points that this is a specific kind of game. It's quite a cerebral game. It's quite a cultured game. It's got a lot of uh, in-depth politics in it. It's got a, a dystopian detective story. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot to untangle. There are layers and layers of game systems. Um, I wrote a thousand words of notes in the last two hours for this game, which is double the length of some full game reviews that I've written in the past. So that should point out just how complicated this one is. I wanted to try and do a good job of distilling this game for you, and I'm going to do my best. Um, the music in this game is by British Sea Power, um, who wrote like a largely kind of instrumental low-key kind of uh, guitar-y, indie, indie rock sounding uh, OST, some of which you can hear right now. I love British Sea Power. I know that band. I've seen them in the past. I, I bought their first EP and I've seen them play a whole bunch of times. They're a great band. They're a really interesting choice for this soundtrack and they did a great job. The music really does elevate the experience and add to the atmosphere. Um, the game did pretty well. It, um, I guess it it massively outstripped expectation. Um, it holds a Metacritic score of 91. It won a lot of game awards. It won four game awards and three BAFTAs, a lot of which focused on the, the music and the narrative design, the writing. Um, some of the latest news is also that a TV adaptation is in the works, um, which is produced by DJ2 Entertainment, a company run by one of the producers of the Sonic the Hedgehog movie. So... Much like The Witcher, um, Disco Elysium is going to get TV treatment, and who knows what what that's going to be like. I really, I really um, struggle to think how they could turn this uh, turn this successfully into a show. But I'm, I'll be glued to it when it comes. Um, I should say that I played the game in 34 hours, so it's not a short game. Although, how long to beat uh, the website that tells you game completion times averaged out by player? has a, a short playthrough at 20 hours and a completionist playthrough at 42. So I came in somewhere in between those and I did go back and loop back and do a lot of side missions. So 
34 hours felt like a reasonable time to me. But to try and describe briefly, in like in a, in a short, compact sentence, what this game is, I took two swings at it. The first says, it's a murder mystery RPG and a consciousness simulator set in a parallel universe dystopia with a deep history. That's one take. My second swing at it was, it's an isometric, narrative-led, point-and-click adventure game that's heart-wrenching, absurd, ingenious, depressing, and hilarious. So, it's a game with a very specific atmosphere. You play a cop who wakes up in a state of undress and disrepair in his trashed hotel room. You have no idea who you are. You have no idea why you are in this hotel, what you're doing there, how long you've been there. Neither does your character. The protagonist of this game has been so trashed and drunk that they've forgotten their own name, they've forgotten their job, they've forgotten everything. They've forgotten everything they've done in the preceding period. They don't know who they are. They have no idea. So they're just kind of this empty, broken vessel, basically. Um, and it starts off with you. Your first task is to try and find your clothes. So the game will list off missions for you. And the first one is find clothes. So you, you get up and limp around the hotel room. You find a pair of kind of horrible flared trousers. You find one shoe and a shirt, a jacket. Um, you examine the window. You find that it's broken. And this is your introduction to your deduction skills. You You have to pass a little intelligence check or perception check and whenever you pass a check, you have a literal dice roll. So two dice will appear, and they'll tell you if you pass that check or not based on your ability points, which you get to assign at the start of the game to different attributes. Um, I passed that check. My character figured out that there was a hole in the window that was roughly the size of a shoe. Went out onto the balcony, you find the other shoe. And so that's the first one complete. There is also a tie that is on the ceiling fan that is spinning around in your hotel room. I failed that check for quite a long time. I think I got my tie down about a third of the way through the game when I'm on my third attempt when I'd powered up some of my abilities quite considerably. But after you've gotten yourself dressed, you come down into the lobby of the hotel and you realise that no one there is happy with you. The manager is mad with you and seems to hate you. There's a bunch of people kind of lying around in reception, all kind of wasted or asleep, some of them have sharp comments for you based on behaviour that you've forgotten. You just know that you've behaved badly. And you also meet Kim Kitsuragi. He's going to be your partner throughout the game. He tells you that you're a cop. He explains to you that there is a murder case that you're supposed to be working on. And you can, you can kind of choose how you talk to Kim. You can try and bluff your way through the conversation, pretending that you know who you are. You can uh, make up a name for yourself, seeing as you've forgotten your name. And like many things in this game, how much you decide to try and make Kim like you, or how much you just do preposterous, ridiculous things and make Kim kind of have a certain disdain for you, is up to you. You can really build this character onto the blank canvas through dialogue choices and through your actions. For example, if you're walking around the, uh, the lobby of the hotel... You will find a spilled drink on the counter with some rum and coke dried onto the counter, just a sticky mess. And you will have an instinct, your character will have an instinct to lick it to try and get the rum. Um, so you pr you quickly realise that your character's got a substance problem, has got all kinds of psychological issues that you're going to be dealing with throughout the game. And you can either struggle with them, against them, or you can lean into them. I decided to go for it. I rolled, took a, a little roll of the dice and uh, licked up some of that rum and coke and got like a, you know, a suitably disgusted, self-loathing response from my character. But the game is pretty compelling right from the off. First of all, the visual style of it, um, every screen that you walk through and the whole environment looks like an oil painting. It has a beautiful style to it. You'll walk across kind of cracked patchworks of concrete and cobbles broken down streets and kind of public squares in disrepair. There's like a kind of a trailer park outside of the the hotel. There is a, a backyard of the hotel that's just like a, a wrecked piece of grass. Um, every Everywhere you go, it's, it's a treat for the eyes, even though it's in a very grey, bleak, kind of beige and brown and dim green kind of palette. 
it's beautiful to look at. It really does feel like you're walking through an oil painting. There is that kind of British Sea Power soundtrack that fades in and out too. So it's it's um, ostensibly like easy on the eye and, and nice to play visually. And as you start to explore the neighbourhood, the game is set across a, a few city blocks. It's an open world game in quite a small play area, but it's very densely packed with stuff. There are statues you can look at. There are newspapers lying around. There's a bookstore where you can flick through books, history books, and look up some of the culture of the, the world that you're living in. You'll find out that you are in a world called Elysium. You're in a city called Revachal, and you are in a particularly downtrodden district of the city called Martinez. And this whole world has a, a deep history to it. Um, it turns out that the country that you're in was once a monarchy, and you'll find references to and stories from the monarchy dotted around the world. That's the old history of the world. The world had a socialist revolution, or communist re revolution, I should say, um, and it went through a kind of a violent period where the people had an uprising, and then that was quashed um, in a war, and it has since become a, a kind of a neoliberal state. And I mean, that story that I just told you of this world is, is not dissimilar from you know, a certain outlook on Estonia. And as the, as the devs are Estonian, I can't help drawing parallels. Um, I've, I've mentioned it in the podcast before, but I have a kind of a special fondness for Estonia. I've been there many, many times, and I've spent a lot of time in Tallinn and exploring the area around Tallinn. And I've come to know a lot of Estonian people, and I am aware that like a lot of people um, around my age were brought up um, in a time when Estonia was part of the Soviet Union and um, lived through it becoming an independent republic and have seen the kind of political and economic ramifications of that and so have a very real understanding of these kind of politics that, that perhaps Western Europeans and Americans mostly think of as uh, things that they've learned from textbooks and history books and in class rather than lived through. Um, and I think both the look of this game the kind of very jumbled mixture of like old architecture, modern architecture, and the kind of political outlook um, all, all fits with what I consider to be the kind of the very specific political awareness that comes from being Estonian. And so I think that Kurvitz has built in that, that, um, that DNA into the game. So the game does have a very strong sense of place. It has a sense of several histories that have been built over each other and the people that have lived through those histories and the, the kind of divergent outlooks and philosophies that the citizens of Martinez hold and the wealth gap that is going on there, um, the kind of the corruption that is going on there, the, the union power, the kind of the capitalists that are swooping in and the old communists and socialists and the kind of the people that are just cast between these different ideologies and that are trying to live their lives is all very present in Disco Elysium. But that's going off on one a little bit about the kind of the ideology of the game. Um, to talk about the, the game itself, it is, um, when, as I played it, a point-and-click game. I guess a lot of people who play it on consoles will have a different experience. But there are a few notable things about it. It's a game that is combat-free, which is really, really refreshing. Um, there are, there's no uh, violence in the game apart from a few kind of story events in which you don't have direct control over your character. Um, you interact with the world mostly by exploring, by examining objects, by um, taking environmental clues, and through conversation. It's a very, very wordy game. It's a very text-heavy game, but the writing is of like such a quality that it didn't, didn't bother me at all as someone who doesn't like to sit and read in games too much. Um, this game managed to pull it off that it was very wordy, very text-heavy, very literary, but also super enjoyable, super compelling, and not at all m making you feel like you're sitting reading a book when you want to be playing a game. The game also has a very strong uh, tabletop gaming element to it. Um, you have a skill set. You can pick your attributes at the start of the game, and then you have to pass checks. So, for example, if you want to persuade someone to do something, you might have to pass a charisma check, which means you'll get a percentage chance of passing it, like, say... If it's a 30% chance, you know you've got about a 1 in 3 chance of rolling your dice, the two dice, and getting the score you need. 
Um, if you want to break down a door again, if your body, uh, your physique skill is, you know, around 70%, you know, you've got a pretty decent chance of passing it. But you have to kind of live with the the failed attempt too. So if you try and break down that door and fail, you have to stand and watch as your character runs at the door and busts his shoulder and then is humiliated and sinks to the ground. And, and Kim Kitsuragi looks on and says, yeah, I didn't think you were going to get it. If you fail a charisma check, then your character will often trip over his own words and say the most ridiculous shit you can imagine. And you have to just kind of stand and, and watch his humiliation. So there is, there is this element of your of your character being a kind of a failure on many fronts as a person, as a human, and that you're kind of engaging in, in that and, and observing him. And uh, the character of... of the unnamed character. He does have a name, but it's a, a plot point, and so I won't spoil it here. Um, is that he is a, something of a blank slate. You know that he's a wreck. You know that he's kind of just a mess, and that he's struggling. Um, but he is a blank slate, so you can you can build him in various directions to some degree. Um, I played him at first as quite a kind of a straight up guy. Um, I didn't. Like, um, he wants to drink all the time, I didn't give him any alcohol, and Kim Kitsuragi suggested that he stay sober. Um, but as the game progressed, I realised that role-playing him leads to certain outcomes, and that it's actually much more fun to to go a little bit wild with him. You're definitely encouraged to do so, to not perhaps take the straight and narrow in this game. And some of the more entertaining outcomes of the game... Uh, do entail kind of letting go of the steering wheel a little bit and perhaps doing things that might be out of character. Um, and for me as a, as, a, as a gamer, I try to role-play characters within my own kind of moral and ethical compass. And this is one game that definitely encourages you to not do that and to do outrageous things, to do extreme things, and to see the outcomes of that. Another aspect of the, the check system is that your clothing affects your abilities meaning that sometimes you'll you'll change your clothes in order to get buffs on your abilities. And it means things like if you're trying to persuade a scientist to let you use their computer, you might need attributes like charisma, which means that you will end up wearing some weird like wardrobe. For example, I remember playing half the game wearing a kimono and some yellow rubber gloves and green bell-bottom trousers, and some kind of, like, weird cap. And so your character kind of looks ridiculous as well as he's moving through this world, and you adjust your wardrobe, um, not based on how it looks, as you do in many games, but based on how it's going to make your character perform, meaning that you're kind of forced into wearing absolutely ridiculous outfits, which is quite kind of funny and endearing, um, as many aspects of this game are in the end. And when I said at the start of the show that I thought of the game as a consciousness simulator, um, that is perhaps the most interesting aspect of this game. You have to deal with the internal monologue and instincts, the warring instincts of your character a lot. You have to deal with your own mind, basically, and the voices in your mind. Um, and this this gets really interesting and kind of philosophical in a way. It's kind of a study on where thoughts come from like what drives the various instincts of being a person. And that's broken down into um, like an interesting kind of take on, on the human mind, basically. So at the start of the game, you will pick skill points in four categories. Intellect, that is like raw brain power. Psyche, or how emotionally intelligent and sensitive you are. Your physique, and then motorics, which is your senses and how agile you are. And so you can add some points to those and you can build that up across the game as your base abilities. And then there are six skills inside of each of those categories. So there are some straightforward ones like uh, logic, rhetoric, empathy, authority and composure. Um, but even, even the straightforward ones have really interesting outcomes. For example, failing a composure check in a conversation will usually be hilarious because your character, you'll just kind of fall apart mid-conversation, you'll start sweating, you'll start doing and saying really pathetic things. Uh, and then there are more intriguing attributes like shivers, which was my personal favourite. It's kind of a sixth sense, and a kind of a feeling for the city of Revachal. 
So when you get a, a shivers moment, uh, the dialogue box, these, these these different instincts appear as voices in the dialogue box. So shivers appears and it gives you a scenario from across town. Like a man comes into his room, he hangs up a coat, he puts away a murder weapon and you'll kind of, you'll get these images of life throughout the city, what the city's thinking, what the city's feeling. The city almost becomes a living thing in your shivers. Um, then there is Inland Empire, which is like your inner monologue. And that will give you some really kind of surreal, poetic kind of uh, feedback. There is Half Light, which is your character's ability to read subtle cues from people or from the world around him. And a kind of a fight or flight response that can be really useful. And another personal favourite of mine was Drama, which is your character's sense of grandiosity. Um, so, you know, you can be various types of cop in this game. There are different archetypes that you can become based on the choices that you make. And if you give in to your sense of drama a lot, you can become like a superstar cop who thinks he's kind of a cop at the top of his game who's going to solve the murder and no problem. And then if you're a very apologetic cop who kind of gives in to his other instincts, you can become a sorry cop who's just like a very sort of sad, apologetic wreck of a person. And so it's a really interesting take on on thoughts and how we think. And you're see, seeing your character navigate this in a really interesting way. And you can, you can add points to these various attributes. So if you fail a check, if you fail a logic check, for example, usually you can come back. If it's a white check, you can come back and try it again later once you've buffed up your logic and solved that puzzle. Then very occasionally there are red checks which you can only try once. And if you fail them, you're locked out of that part of the game. So all of that is really intriguing, and it does mean that by the time I got to the end of the game, I felt like I was just starting to kind of fully understand the range of options that were available to me, and to really understand those uh, 24 different uh, skills that you can build up, and how they all relate to the kind of gameplay experience that you have. And it does mean that there is a wide range of different journeys that you can take. Um, for example, my, my cop was kind of creative, psychically sensitive cop. Um, he wasn't very physical and aggressive, and um, there's a skill called electromagnetism that is how your character deals with cravings and addiction. Whereas if I'd, if I'd picked a cop that was like a, a big, heavy unit who was barging down doors and uh, winning fights and, you know, being very physical in the world, I would have had a very, very different response. I would have had a lot of different text, different dialogue options to choose from, different outcomes that I could have achieved, different checks that I would have passed and failed. And so you, you can have a really different experience of this game based on how you play it. And I guess from an RPG point of view, that is something that people think of as a really good thing. And it means that the game does have replay value. So I might well play it again when it comes out on console. In fact, I think I can say that I definitely will. This is a really, really good game. to give away any spoilers for anyone that is yet to play this game I'm going to give you a little spoiler break now and I'm going to spend the last part of the podcast just running through a few of the most memorable moments from the journey of playing Disco Elysium I will say that it's a fantastic game, it's a one-off I really do feel like it does things with this genre that I haven't seen before, that it moves the genre forward I can see why it won the awards that it did um, it's heavily recommended, and if you're leaving now, then uh, please do come and join me on social media at Gaming in the Wild on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitch. I'd love to hear what you're playing. I'd love to hear what your thoughts of Disco Elysium are. If you're looking forward to it, if you've played it, um, if you're planning to buy the console port, so do come and find me as Gaming in the Wild on social media. And if you're sticking with me, I'll be right back after this. So Disco Elysium 
I mean, we're past the spoiler break now, so if you're still listening and you're yet to play the game, uh, you might find some things in this section that you would prefer not to have known, so final warning. But I mean, this is a game that's full of magic moments. I think one of mine was when my sense of drama in the early game called me out based on some of the decisions that I had made and said, are you a boring cop? You seem like a boring cop. Are you just trying to please people? Maybe you should cut loose a little. You've been picking a lot of medium, inoffensive, equivocal responses. And it was encouraging me to pick other things. There were some really grandiose or surreal or belligerent dialogue options that I was steering away from because they aren't things that I would ever choose to say in real life. And I want my character to somewhat feel like me. But after I had had that encouragement from the game, I did start picking other types of dialogue options. And I thought that was such a cool thing. It was like the game kind of giving you a little nudge or rather an elbow in the ribs to say like, you should cut loose, you should play this game differently. And I really appreciated that and it, and it led me to some really, really fun outcomes. Um, the game's politics are also pretty much worn on the sleeve. For example, when you get into political conversation, which is quite often, um, you'll deal with uh, sort of ethno-racists, you'll deal with extreme wealthy capitalists, you'll deal with union leaders and like uh, cops of different stripes and you'll deal with members of the political elite and you'll deal with like members of the underclass and so you're constantly having to engage with people on these different scales um, and you, you kind of slowly map out your own politics and there are trophies in the game for example, you can become the world's most laughable centrist if you defend the political centre. There's a trophy for that. You can become the biggest communism builder for when you employ critical thinking. So, I mean, right there, the, the developers are saying that critical thinking equals communism and that defending the political centre is laughable, which is, you know, it's fair enough. It's fair enough that they put their own politics in the game. You can be literally the sorriest cop on earth if you apologise too much. I apologise quite a lot and got that trophy. Or you can be an unbelievably boring fuck if you <laughs> say boring things or mundane things in conversation. Um, so there are all of these hilarious trophies that you can get and the game kind of constantly trolls you on the way that you're playing as Harry. And now that we're past the spoiler break, I can tell you that the cop's name is Harry Dubois. Um, although you can create an entirely fictional name and... Uh, you can get a trophy for that too, for just completely lying about who you are, um, even when confronted by the reality of it. I mean, other memorable moments in the game were, at one point, after you get out of the initial neighbourhood of the game, of Martinez, you come down a kind of an abandoned coastline to a fishing village. There's an old boardwalk, old factories, and you find a body on the boardwalk of a guy who's been drinking... He's slipped through a gap in the boardwalk and his body has become stuck and frozen and he's died. And so it's a side quest in the game. You can investigate his ID. I think you have to call into a library to get his name and then call into a police department later. And eventually you find his address. You go there, you meet his wife and there is a, a moment in the game where you, you kind of, you know you're going to have to tell her what's happened. And Kim Kitsuragi your partner so is very steadfast and he's like, just do your best, you know, be honest, be realistic, be gentle. And you have to roll a couple of checks in this. And I was thinking, oh my God, please don't let me fail this check. I want to do well here. Luckily for me, I passed the checks and my character got through it. Very matter of fact answers, sympathetic answers, and then you come out of it. Um, and it really, really gave you a feeling of how hard that must be to actually have to do that. And the level of kind of, you know, how much is at stake when you're in that kind of situation based on your personal responses. Um, some of them are much lighter than that. For example, at the start of the game, Harry notices that the, the hotel has a stage, um, a disco ball and a mic, and he becomes determined to perform on that stage. The superstar cop inside of him and his sense of drama say that it's his destiny to perform on that stage and throughout the course of the game you have to find a tape to sing you have to find a song you have to persuade the manager with a bunch of checks by appeasing him with items that you find eventually at the end of the game 
at least for me it was the end. I, I had all of the stuff ready for karaoke and I did karaoke, got up on the stage, failed a confidence check and then Harry turned in the most hilariously bad karaoke performance imaginable, just off-key, crying and wailing. Um, and I, I was just, you know, I had tears in my eyes from laughing so much. It was just brilliant. Um, I actually went back to my save before that and passed the check just to see. And he turned in like a kind of an average Tom Waitsy performance. So I was really glad that I failed that check. There is also a quest where you come to an abandoned church and there's kind of a quite a lengthy chunk of uh, of game there. There are some ravers camping outside who want to start an anodic rave club. Um, but the church is haunted and it has also got a scientist in there who is studying a potential rift in reality that is in the church. And that, that's just a fantastic quest line. I actually went all the way through that one, passed some checks, failed some checks, came back and did them again with buffed up skills. Finally got to the end, helped the, the kids start their rave club. They became friends with the scientists, the whole kind of community of weirdos that were congregating around this abandoned building um, helped set up the sound system. And then you, you can dance. You have to roll a check and then your character does this like amazing dance. It's the only time in the whole game when you see the animation. I was lucky enough to do it in the daytime when Kit Kitsuragi was with me. And even Kit Kitsuragi danced along with me and it's just this moment of lightness in this this sea of this kind of uh, this game that's loaded with um, depression and kind of difficulty and the downtrodden political reality of this grim world, but it is littered with these amazing moments of dancing and karaoke and getting to know Kim and kind of piecing together your life. Um, and I, I really appreciated that about the game, despite all of the the harsh nature of the storyline it's a game that does offer you some really really light moments of levity that make it all hang together there were many others too there's a there's a cryptozoology storyline where you are trying to find a phasmid um, a mythical creature um, and you will encounter the phasmid and have this this most interesting surreal magical realist conversation with this huge stick insect that just kind of appears from some reeds towards the end of the game and if you've carried out a quest beforehand and you have the right skills you can converse with it and have this very meditative philosophical conversation and by the end of the game you get to the bottom of harry's torment he is heartbroken he is um hitting he's been hitting drugs and drink hard the job's been taking a toll on him and depending on how you play him you get like a psychological evaluation at the end of the game um, and you can, you know, I was lucky enough to have done enough good work in the game with Harry to have um, solved the case, to have uh, discovered this magical creature and to have gotten photographic evidence of it. And so I was allowed to stay on the force and Kim Kitsuragi became my partner. So I would say I got the good ending, but I would be very curious what the not good endings are. But I don't know. Um, I'm very excited about the console versions of this game. I am going to try and play it on the consoles too. But I hope that for anyone who is thinking of playing it, that this podcast was useful. Um, it's a great game. Um, I think some people will bounce from it, but I think many will find a very rich world in this game to enjoy. I certainly did. That's Disco Elysium. <laughs> So that's the show. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed hearing about Disco Elysium. It's a heavy recommendation from me. I'll be back next week with a new episode. Not sure what it will be on yet. Maybe I'll get through Sea of Solitude. Maybe I'll get through Maquette. Or maybe it will be me pulling something out of the archive because I just played more Fallout 4. Um, but I hope you enjoyed it. Please come and find me on social media at Gaming in the Wild. You're also very welcome to sign up for Patreon and support the show via patreon.com slash gaming in the wild if you'd like to i appreciate everyone that does very much take care of yourselves and each other bye bye for now <laughs>